Now, it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, John Haverman. He's a PhD executive director of economic education delegation called NEED. He's um, well-versed in economics, PhD and master's of science in economics from U, U of Michigan and a BS from U of Wisconsin. Senior economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors and an economist with the Federal Trades Commission. And he's held a uh, position with the business school at Purdue. So John, are you there? Sounds good. Yeah, happy to take questions along the way, and then I'll be happy to stick around as long as you'd like me to uh, at the end for a Q&A. All right. Um, You're on. I'm going out of the chair so you can share your screen. Sounds good. There we go. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to be, to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, COVID-19 and the economy, um, so I hope nobody's really down in the dumps and relying on me to, to pull them out. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be that kind of a talk. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot to talk about. Um, not a lot of it's uh, good at this point, um, but we'll get there. Uh, first, let me tell you a little bit more about NEED, the National Economic Education Delegation. NEED is a nonprofit that I started just a little bit over three years ago. Um, it, it really started out of my displeasure with politicians who seem to use economics as a, as a weapon for their own personal agenda rather than as a tool for social good. Um, and I figured they get away with that because the electorate doesn't know uh, very much about economic policy um, and, and how economists think about economic policy. And I, I put the, the, the responsibility for that squarely on the shoulders of the economics profession. Because we know a ton about economic policies, we just don't tell anybody. We publish in esoteric journals um, and then move on. Um, so need is an effort to, in a very nonpartisan way, um, get economists out into the wild um, giving talks much like this one uh, to Rotary, Rotary Kiwani, uh, Chambers of Commerce. Uh, we do a bunch of talks in high schools. Um, wherever people, people gather to listen to somebody speak, um, we would like to get in and give a talk on your preferred policy topic. Um, I've gotten a lot of buy-in from the economics profession. Um, to date, there are 53 members of, of NEED's honorary board. Uh, they include most prominently Janet Yellen um, and Ben Bernanke. Um, the two previous chairs of the Federal Reserve, and Janet Yellen is our incoming, hopefully, uh, incoming Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and we've got a bunch of former chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors, um, both under D Democrat presidents and R Republican presidents, three Nobel Prize winners, um, and then 585 other uh, members of the delegation. Uh, these are PhD, largely academic economists, um, who are helping to write the slide decks Right, whenever somebody presents on a topic for need, they're, they're using the same slide deck as everybody else who presents on that topic so that we, we maintain uniformity of message um, and our nonpartisan basis. So they help write them and they, they go out and present them. Um, I mentioned we have a bunch of different topics. Um, these are the topics on which we currently speak. Oops. Um, we have uh, a couple more slide decks on uh, diversity and equity coming out. Um, but if any of these look interesting to you, I'd be happy to either come back myself or send somebody else from the delegation in um, to speak on any of these topics. Uh, I will send uh, Ron this list uh, in, in an email, uh, so you'll have it. I'll also send a, a link for my slides generally, so if you're interested in having the slides um, when all is said and done, um, you can go to Need's website and get them. All right, so let's, let's get on to coronavirus economics. Um, this slide deck we have a, a group at NEED who's working on these slides because they are ever-changing. Um, includes myself, Scott Bayer, the chair of the economics department at Clemson University, Jeffrey Walglum, emeritus, retired from Amherst College, and Brian Dumbeck at the Lewis and Clark College. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting sort of a summary of what we're thinking about uh, coronavirus economics. Uh, we'll outline, we'll talk some about the evidence of the impact, the impact on labor markets and GDP. Uh, we'll talk about government policy, primarily fiscal policy, just a little bit on monetary policy. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, the path going forward. All right, so let's, let's turn first to the evidence of the impact, right? Um, where I turn first is consumer spending, because um, consumer spending, as I'll show you in a minute, is a, a huge driver of the economy. Um, but this graph shows you consumer spending, this blue line, relative to where it was um, in the first part of this year. Uh, this is January 20, and consumer spending up and down a little bit. This is when we heard about it uh, first developing in China, but then we figured, oh, that's nothing. So we went back, but now then we heard about Iran and, uh, and Italy. 
um, and people stopped going out, states started closing down, um, and we troughed here in early April. Uh, we stayed down in terms of consumer spending for about three weeks, really not very long, um, until we got tired of being sheltered in place and not spending, so we went back out. Um, we had a nice uh, late spring recovery, um, sort of summer doldrums, um, heading into fall stagnation, um, and December was really not, uh, November and December, really not very good months for consumer spending. Um, so uh, th that hints at what we might expect for, for a Q4 GDP for the United States. It, it might not be as favorable as, as we would wish. All right, so this is total spending, which in early December was down about 1.7% relative to January. I apologize, these are the latest data available. Um, but uh, some sector, sectors of the economy took a much bigger hit than others, as I'm sure we're all aware. This is basically the same graph, um, but for three different parts of the economy. Uh, restaurants and hotels, spending in restaurants and hotels is down about a quarter. Uh, spending on transportation uh, is still down about nearly a half. I right? think uh, airplanes, buses, trains, um, and entertainment uh, and recreation. Right? People aren't going to the movies. Um, it's down, they're not going to plays, it's down about 52%, a little bit more than half uh, relative to where it was in January. And so consumer spending um, down very significantly um, and in some sectors. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the drain or the, the, the pressure, the downward pressure on the economy. So I mentioned that uh, consumption is very important, consumer spending. Um, consumer spending. This is this is all the categories and shares of GDP for 2019, um, and consumers spend on goods, and we spend on services, right? So that is about two thirds of the U.S. economy. About two thirds of the U.S. economy is driven um, by consumer spending. Government spending makes up another big chunk. Net exports, residential fixed investment, um, and other non-residential investment make up the rest. But consumer spending, about two thirds. Um, that's sort of historically low. It's generally been about 70%. Um, but we're in a period where consumer spending is making up a little bit le less of GDP growth, especially during the pandemic. Right, so we can look at the impact of that consumer spending on GDP, right? We go back here, these are the, the blue bars going up uh, are when we had a quarter of GDP growth. The red bar is going down or when we had decline in GDP. Uh, this, this green line is potential GDP growth. Um, and this is the great recession of a decade ago, right, where we had a number of quarters strung together. Um, and we thought that that recession was horrible. Um, well, then we had a bunch of growth until we got to Q1 uh, of this year. I was really surprised that uh, just the, the impact of March was enough to send GDP growth down in Q1. Q2 um, was where the, the rubber really hit the road um, and we had a decline in GDP of about 34%. A nice rebound in Q3 of about 33%. Um, that said, right, these two don't offset, right? So this was a 34% decline from a higher base. This was a 33% increase from a lower base, right? So GDP, although those, those quarterly growth rates are pretty comparable, GDP remains below where it was in the fourth quarter of 2019, All right? So if, if 100 uh, is GDP in the fourth quarter of last year, right? The, the orange bar here, this is the trajectory of GDP going into Q1. So we had a minor decline in Q1, a major decline in Q2 of this year, and then a significant increase in Q3. Right, the blue line is what GDP probably would have done in the absence of the pandemic. Right, so we're at 96.5. That means we're down about 3.5 percentage points relative to Q4 2019. Um, but we are about 5% below trend GDP growth. And it's we're 5% off of where we think we otherwise might have been. Uh, so G Q4 uh, GDP will come out towards the end of this month. I think it's January 28, maybe 29. Um, and I expect that to be darn near zero. Um, December was not a good month. Um, November also not great. Uh, it may turn out to be negative, um, but I don't expect it to be positive um, in any amount that's worth talking about. Um, so I have a pessimistic view about Q4 of, 2000 of this year. Right. Let's look at employment. 
right? This is a graph that I've been presenting for oh, about 15 years now. Um, and when I presented it in 2019, I would show this area. This is the Great Recession of 10 years ago, the global financial crisis, right? And we thought this was a mountain of job loss, right? We got a lot of job losses. It peaked at around 700,000 jobs lost in a given month. Um, and then we had the blue bars again, our job increases, 10 years, 10 straight years of job increases. Very happy about that until boom, we got hit with the pandemic, right? And there's March and there's April. In April, we lost 20.8 million jobs. The economy, there's the, the rebound in the, in the early, the late spring. Uh, May and June were great. And then things started to taper off, right? We got the doldrums that I talked about. Um, and then in November, employment growth was, you know, not out of line with anything that we had seen previously. And in December, we got job loss. Yeah. Um, so the economy really starting to slow down. We lost 140,000 jobs in December. We can, we can zoom in on uh, the latest experience, right? So this bar for April, um, it's cut off because if I went minus 20 million on it, we'd be all the way down here somewhere. All right, so this is the recovery and the recovery slowing down and turning into another decline. All right, so employment is down very significantly. In December, employment was down um, in particular in leisure and hospitality, mostly in food services, restaurants and bars. Right? Restaurants and bars lost 372,000 jobs um, in December alone. Leisure and hospitality totaled about a half a million decline. It's down. Uh, about 3.9 million from January of this year. So right down about 23%. Private education, uh, I think private schools, the tutors, uh, that was down 63,000 in December. Um, and government employment down 45,000, um, down 52,000 in local government, right? So federal government employment increased, but overall employment in the government sector is down about 1.3 million. Right now, this is a lot more than that 140,000 net job losses, but there are other parts of the economy like retail um, that had gains. They're about, you know, most of the rest of the economy had gains, right? Um, that said, employment remains very low relative to we might, where we might expect it to be. Right? So this, this graph goes back through the global financial crisis. And the green line here, that is um, long-term trajectory of employment. The red line here is what we actually experienced. And this is uh, a forecast, right? Um, and so had we not had the global financial crisis and had we not had a pandemic, we would have expected the number of jobs to be 176.2 million, right? After the global financial crisis, we had lots of job losses and we never got back up to this line where we expected to be. Part of that is the retiring of the baby boomers. About half of that's the retiring of the baby boomers. About half of it is that companies just shed a lot of jobs that they didn't need, right? So we were down about 24 million, right? And then the pandemic hit, right? We dropped about 10 million and we've come back, back up. Uh, I'm sorry, we dropped about 20 million. We've come back up to where we're down um, just a little under 10 million jobs relative to where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Overall, oops, pardon me. Uh, overall, um, in 2020, uh, we were down 6.2% of all of our employment, right? So these, this is the amount of employment growth or decline experienced in each year, right? So this is the employment decline from the global financial crisis. We thought that was big and bad um, until we got to 2020. A whole new definition of what's big and bad. And so employment is down. So of course, unemployment is up. On here, I have two measures of unemployment. The blue line here is the headline unemployment number. That's the one that uh, was put out just last Friday and everybody was talking about how it dropped a little bit to 6.7%. The green line is a measure of unemployment that I think is much more accurate and appropriate um, for what we're experiencing. Um, and that, that includes everybody who's sort of marginally attached to the labor force or out of work for economic reasons. Um, and that unemployment rate went up to about 22.9% uh, in April. Now it's probably, that's still a little bit below where it was during the great depression of the, of the 30s, um, but, uh, but very, very elevated relative to where it was, right? It was down around 7%, 23%. And it's come down a lot. Um, in December, it was 11.7%, right? but that's still a very highly elevated uh, amount of unemployment. 
Now, I'm John, surprised. John, we have a couple of questions. If we oh, could. sure. Yeah, related to this, um, the new unemployment claims seem to be running about 800,000 each week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that a trend that's likely to continue or at some point will it level off or drop? Um, so I, I think it's likely to continue um, probably through January. Uh, hopefully um, things will start getting better once we get through sort of the, the holiday bump um, in coronavirus cases. When cases start coming down, things will start to open back up again. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, that, that's probably a few months off, but continuing job losses um, into January, hopefully it, they'll, they'll start to, to decline um, going into February and March. And that, that's well, my best cloudy crystal ball guess. And a second question about state and local governments. So they have to balance their budgets. Yep. Are they likely to lay off a bunch of people uh, in 2021? Yep, so I've got a couple of slides coming up on that. Um, so if that question is still outstanding when I get there, I'd be happy to address it then. How about that? Okay. All right. Okay, um, so part of the reason the unemployment rate is down at 6.7% overall and 117 in terms of this other measure is that people are just dropping out of the labor force, right? Um, and this, this, again, is relative to the dash line is where it's zero. That's where we would have expected the size of the labor force to be, and it would have kept growing. It's just zero here for convenience. But in the in the in the wake of the the, the global financial crisis, right, people dropped out of the labor force and just didn't come back in. To the point where at the end of of 2019, we were down about 10 million people. The labor force was 10 million people smaller than we expected it to be. And just a ton of people have completely dropped out of the labor force. Um, about 5 million people have dropped out of the labor force um, during the pandemic. Um, this includes uh, a lot of women, more women than men. Right? So this is the number in millions of people who have left the labor force. Right? Women in greater numbers than men have left, left the labor force, though not in huge numbers. Um, a lot of people are more worried about the long-term implications for women dropping out of the labor force than for men, because a lot of women dropped out because they have young kids. Um, and a lot of them might just decide, well, you know, this is working for me. I'm going to stay out as long as my, my kids are in school and then maybe I'll go back in. So this may have long term implications for the size of our labor force and that, in, that impacts uh, GDP growth going forward. It's also been very inequitable uh, by race. So the, the maroon line here, this is the percent uh, of white workers that dropped out of the labor force, about one and two thirds percent. Um, and this is the percent of black workers who dropped out of the labor force a little bit more than three, maybe 3.3% 3 .3 of the labor force. Huge inequities, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, um, but just huge inequities brought about by the pandemic. So here are continuing unemployment claims. Um, you can see back here before the pandemic, we had continuing unemployment claims. This is, these are people who continue on a weekly basis to re receive unemployment checks. It's not initial claims that we were discussing just a minute ago, um, but you can see how continuing claims, uh, the, the sort of aqua bar here is, is uh, at the state level. Uh, the red bar is the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, PEUC claims. Right, you can see that didn't rise very much um, until we sort of got to the end of September. Um, and then as people started running out of their access to the state level claim, this is for California, people started running out of access to their state level claim, they went to the so this, this navy blue line is probably more reflective of continuing claims. Um, it runs at about 20.7 continued com com combined claims for 100 people. Right, so that's very, very high. Um, so in terms of policy, uh, there, there's a ton more going on in the economy, and I could just keep going on and on about that. And I'm happy to take questions about uh, um, any particular st statistics that you're interested in, but I thought I'd turn to policy at this point. Um, we've got really three different aspects of policy. One is the social policy, and I want to talk a little bit about the economics of that. Um, and then we've got fiscal policy, what exactly is the federal government doing, um, and monetary policy. Mon monetary policy, I won't address directly, but I'll sort of touch on it as we go. Excuse me. Um, so from, from a social policy perspective, I want to talk a little bit about the flattening of the curve, right? And I like to talk about this because the more I talk to people, the more I find that a lot of people think that flattening the curve is likely to get us out of this uh, sooner 
um, than had we not done anything. Um, and that, in fact, is not the case. Uh, so what we, what we would have seen probably without protective measures is a really rapid run up in the number of cases. This is the number of daily cases over time. We've seen, we've seen a really rapid run up uh, to a pretty high level and then perhaps herd immunity would cause that to come down and cases would start to go away, right? Well, as we social distance, as we close down the economy, um, you know, it's gonna, well, I, I'm sorry, part of the reason we do that, uh, we're gonna go into, we're gonna do our social distancing is that our, our healthcare system has capacity limits. Right. And if we just let her rip, we don't do any social distancing, then all of these folks um, are going to go without health care and a lot more people will die than is strictly necessary. Right. So what we want to do is we want to push down on the top of this and that's flattening the curve. When it turns out when we push down on the top of that, it push the, pushes the curve out. So with protective measures, this is what we're going to have in terms of a, a timeline of daily cases. Right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rise more slowly, it's going to peak at a lower level, and then it's going to come down over time. Right? Now, you notice um, that the peak of this, this graph, I've, I've drawn it so that that's still above our current healthcare capacity. And that's partly because we've bought ourselves a bunch of time. We bought our bunch of, ourselves a bunch of time during which hopefully we can expand our healthcare capacity so that we have enough of it. Right? So the, the goal is to prevent deaths and to prevent more people from having long-term health consequences. And sort of economists put a value at the estimate of reduced deaths from all the social distancing and sheltering in place and shutting down of the economy that we did, um, put, a, put a value of that in a little in excess of $5 trillion, right? Okay, so that's the benefit uh, associated with social distancing, but there's gonna be an economic cost. So going down, we're gonna look at the economic implications. And this red, red uh, area, this is what would happen to the economy if we just let the coronavirus rip. Right? It would take a little while, um, but then the economy would start to contract significantly. It would peak at a relatively a trough, I should say, at a relatively high level, um, and then come back. But if we institute protective measures, we're going to have, or, right, we shut the economy down in a hurry. We slammed the door, kept everybody at home. So it uh, went down really fast, troughed much more deeply, and took much longer to come back. Right, so the benefit is lives saved, and the cost of flattening the curve is the difference between these two curves. Right, the increased injury to the economy. Right, the increased injury to the economy, people estimated to be about two trillion dollars. Right, so this is really well well worth doing, right, because we get five five trillion dollars worth of lives saved at a cost of two trillion dollars to the economy. Unfortunately, the story doesn't quite end there. Right? Because this was a story that I was telling um, back when the number of new cases each day looked something like this. Right Here, there was going up rapidly, and then we shut down the economy in mid to late April, and things started getting better. Right? We flattened the curve, and things started getting better. But then came Memorial Day, July 4, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and this is what the trajectory of cases has looked like since April. Right. We came out of sheltering in place too soon. We had a summer peak, uh, started to trough, and then we got Labor Day, uh, and things started going up again. Here, this little trough, this is that's just lack of reporting during the Thanksgiving holiday, but then we got an acceleration of cases. This trough is a lack of reporting around Christmas, um, and then we started to accelerate again. And here we are experiencing the acceleration. Uh, this is nationwide experiencing this, the acceleration in cases that are due to sort of the combined effect of Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, and New Year's. Um, uh, people didn't didn't uh, didn't shut down the parties that they were intending to have, and so our cases are accelerating. Unfortunately, so are deaths. And this is uh, the 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 line here is a seven-day moving average of deaths in each of these bars. There's a number of deaths that are reported on a daily basis, and so we got things under control. Being out, got things under control, and now things have gotten. <clears throat> The date there have been about 374,000 total deaths, right? So, so we can go back to the benefit cost analysis that I was doing um, and saving lives, hurting the economy. Well, we came out too soon. So we had to shelter in place again, shut down the economy again. When that happens, that adds more economic damage. It doesn't save more lives, right? but it causes more economic damage. So the gap between the benefits of sheltering in place and the costs have been declining. 
And every time uh, we, we open the economy back up and have to shut it down, um, we are costing ourselves businesses, in particular, small businesses, right? We've got the PPP, sure, that gets, you know, paycheck protection pro program, but small businesses have lots of other expenses, right? And every time we shut them down, we're putting them in a more financially precarious position. So they may, may open up again, but if we shut down again, they may be gone. The more times we open and shut, uh, the, the greater the cost of the economy. And so we can look a little bit about daily, at daily cases in California, because I'm, I'm guessing you're all curious if you're not well up on this, right? So California has looked pretty good. The trend, trend looked pretty good relative to the rest of the country um, until we got into the fall and we had dramatic acceleration of cases. And this is, this is I, I want to say, largely uh, Southern California, uh, Los Angeles in particular. Um, the recent trends, it looks like uh, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas haven't hurt California quite as much as other places. Um, we do have accelerating numbers of deaths. All right, so turning to fiscal policy, um, you know, these are, are the policies that were enacted. Uh, in, um, mm -hmm. We had a lot of money spent, about $3 trillion, uh, but the last time Congress acted was April 24. Um, our Congress has, has since acted uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, but in the intervening time, there was an enormous fiscal policy gap, right? Unemployment payments, um, the, the enhanced unemployment payments ran out at the end of July. That was a long time ago. Um, so unemployment payments have not been sufficient. Low wage workers, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, are losing jobs in disproportionate numbers. Small businesses have been struggling. Renters can't pay rent. Um, estimated 70, 7 trillion, $70 billion worth of back rent that hasn't been paid. Lines at food banks are growing. Um, states and local governments are, in fact, slashing employment. Right? We just got a new fiscal package. Uh, what's in it? Um, there are $600 payment checks to individuals. Um, those started going out last week. Uh, maybe increased to $2,000, um, depending on what the new Congress decides to do. I know President, incoming President Biden would like that very much. Um, we could talk about whether or not that's a good idea or very well targeted use of funds. I, I'll argue that it's not terribly well targeted, um, but a useful thing to do. Uh, $300 in additional unemployment benefits on a weekly basis through March. The notion that we're going to be out of this uh, in March, um, I think is highly unlikely. And so that will have to be extended. $284 billion, it's additional paycheck protection program, and that'll be helpful. And they've, they've reorganized it, so it's targeting uh, small businesses more, um, in particular small businesses uh, owned by minorities. So that's, that's a good step. $82 billion for schools and universities. Um, not nearly enough, I don't think, because if you think about the size of the United States and all the schools and universities, $82 billion really doesn't go very far. Uh, $68 billion for vaccine distribution. I really don't have a good sense for whether that's enough. Um, as with everything else, my, my guess is that it's probably not, um, but, uh, but it's a lot of money. Uh, 25 billion for rental assistance. As I mentioned, I think people in, are in arrears on rent to the tune of about 70 billion. So that, that leaves a lot of it uh, uncovered. Um, and 93 billion um, in other support. Right. So that's a lot of money, just shy of a trillion dollars. Um, but I think most economists are of the view that it is simply not enough. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the implications for the de federal debt. I'll put that up in a minute. Right. So what's missing? You know, real help to households. Um, I will argue that for those households that are in need, six hundred dollars isn't going to go very far. Um, you know, it's kind of a nice soundbite. We'll give you six hundred dollars, but if you're if six months in arrears on rent, um, that's not going to help very much. State and local support in significant amounts is not included. Real support for renters is not there. Targeted, really targeted small business support, and, and in particular for independent contractors. Um, there's a, an article, uh, I think, in the New York Times not long ago that you know there were some folks who would apply and maybe got twenty seven dollars. Um, in relief. Um, $27 really not going to take you very far. In terms of state and local employment, going back to our question, um, state and local governments have been shedding a lot of jobs, um, down about 1.4 uh, million jobs since the start of the pandemic, right? And in California, it's doing okay, um, but the rest of the country, many, many states are not doing very well. Um, so my suspicion is that this number will continue to decline. Um, and it's, it's really state and local uh, spending where the rubber hits the road for a lot of us. 
um, in terms of protective services, fire and police and education services, right? A lot of those job declines are gonna be in uh, police force, right? Uh, I have a graph that I couldn't quite find to, to include here, but in the wake of the, the global financial crisis, um, there were about 30% declines uh, in protective forces nationwide. Um, and that had not recovered at the start of the pandemic. Right? Um, small businesses, as I've mentioned a few times, they're struggling enormously. Um, small businesses, about 17% of those in professional and business services have closed temporary, permanently, we don't know. About 30% of all of them and about 50% um, in leisure and hospitality. Um, don't know how many of those will come back. Don't know how long it will take uh, for their replacements to come into being. Um, so that will be probably a force that extends the duration of the recovery. Uh, with respect to PPP um, and small businesses, right? This is a survey uh, asked by creditcards.com, right? And only about 30% of the small businesses uh, that they asked got any PPP funds. But you can see just a ton of other ones took money off of their personal credit card, the business credit card account, other types of loan, uh, got it from friends and family, right? And all of this, all of this puts um, other small businesses, a ton of small businesses in a, for, in a more financially precarious position. And even when we're out of all of this, if they're still surviving, um, it's possible that they will have a higher death rate than they either, otherwise would because of the financial financial position that they'll be in as a result of the pandemic, right? So, I, I continue to argue for a lot more aid for small businesses, and not only because I am one. Um, so, looking forward at the federal budget implications, right? Uh, the federal deficit is going to reach rec record levels, um, about three point eight trillion. Um, these numbers actually predate um, the latest spending package, so that might be closer to four point eight trillion. Uh, it'll come down significantly, but be elevated going forward. In terms of uh, the impact on the debt, um, by the way, Need has a really great presentation on the federal debt and a couple of guys who present it really well. If you're really concerned about this issue and would like to hear what economists think, All right? So this is GDP, this is debt as a percent of GDP. Um, when this all started, uh, our debt was about 81% of GDP. It's now up over 100%. Um, prior to the last trillion dollars that was allocated, uh, it was going to rise up to 107% of GDP by the year 2025, whereas it would have been down at 89%. Right now, you know, I'll, I'll, if, if we come back in to talk to you all about debt, we'll go into more detail. Um, but I don't know. No economist knows if this is trouble. Uh, is it more trouble than this was? Or does trouble really set in when we get up around 200%? Um, we, we, we just don't know. Um, what economists are, are sort of uniquely aligned on is that we do have to do this right now. We have to engage in this spending, um, in this social insurance and the support for those who are injured by the pandemic. It is a good idea. Um, it passes benefit cost analysis, although when this is all over, we're going to have to think long and hard um, exactly about exactly what we do um, in terms of the debt going forward. Because it was, it was in bad shape um, even before we got here. Okay, so looking forward, um, most GDP projections uh, think that growth will be positive in 2021, um, likely well above the 2 to 2.5% range, um, partly because that's, it's catch up. Um, nobody thinks that long term GDP is going to be much outside of the 2 to 2.5% range once we've recovered. Um, but 2021 will hopefully be, uh, the second half at least, will hopefully be a significant year of recovery. Um, the Federal Reserve's range for growth is pretty wide. Um, that's because there is a lot of uncertainty about when we're going to get uh, the health uh, of the country back where it should be. Um, while unemployment is expected to decline, unemployment uh, is going to stay above 4.1% for quite some time. Um, and finally, you know, the Fed, Fed thinks the economy is structurally sound. Um, otherwise, they would have increased the long-term uh, natural rate of unemployment above 4.1%. Nobody thinks that the economy had anything unsound going forward, going into this. Um, so that's gonna help with recovery. In terms of GDP projections for 2020, they're kind of all over the board. Um, I think the OECD and Kiplinger, uh, as well as uh, Consumer Board, 
it's probably going to be in the three to five percent range. Um, uh, the IMF probably needs to update theirs. Um, but uh, you know, 2020 is going to be a bad. Have, going to have been a bad year. Um, and again, um, positive growth in 2021 of two to 2.5, if not more. All right. So there's always the questions are going to be V-shaped recovery. I think we, we're all uh, aware that it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery as much as our, our um, current president wishes that it was going to be. Um, it's going to be a K-shaped recovery or something else. I'll talk a little bit about what a K-shaped recovery is. Um, aggregate data look pretty good because of the, the $3 trillion in spending that was passed in the spring. Um, that stopped uh, at the end of July, largely. Um, and it's hurt uh, low-income workers and small firms, uh, hard-hit sectors, restaurant and entertainment and transportation, state and local governments, right? Um, my, uh, my sense of what the recovery is gonna look like, we'll talk about the K, but I think it's gonna look like a Nike swoosh, right? We've come back pretty quickly. We went down hard, coming back pretty quickly, but then it's gonna tail off for a long time. Um, CBO, Congressional Budget Office, and thinks, in fact, thinks that it might be 2029 before we get back to where we otherwise would have been. Right? Remember, as we're recovering, the economy in the absence of the pandemic would have been recovering about 2 to 2.5% a year. In order to get that back, it's going to take perhaps the next eight or nine years. All right, so what's, what's the K-shaped recovery? Um, right? Those with financial wealth, residential real estate, they've seen they're doing pretty well. Right. There's a table that I didn't include on, on how bil billionaires are doing throughout this. Billionaires are doing just fine. That's the top part of the K, nice recovery. High income earners have largely cut their jobs. Middle and low income earners have depressed employment rates. Right. So that's the bottom of the K, right? The top, the top of the K is the top of the income distribution. The bottom of the K is the bottom of the income distribution. Folks at the bottom um, are hurting badly. Women dropping out of the labor force. Food insecurity is pretty high. Right, so let's look briefly at what's going on with stock markets. So this is the, the red line here is the S&P 500 um, and the blue is the Dow Jones, right? S&P 500, both are in record territory. Never seen this before. This was where we were back on February 19 before things started to, to tank. Um, pretty quick recovery and everybody else, everybody asks, you know, what's going on with the stock market? Um, you know, well, and while the economy is in the doldrums, well, the stock market is not the economy to quote Kai Rizdal. Um, there's no place else to put your money that's gonna get you any sort of return. There aren't a lot of investments in new business ventures going on um, and treasury rates are so low. So people are putting all of their money and I'll show you in a minute, the savings rates are pretty high. So they're putting a lot of money into the stock market, driving it up into probably, I don't wanna say bubble, but elevated territory. So you know, in the next year or so, we might well anticipate some sort of a correction, right? Another thing's, the thing that's driving it, um, is that there is a huge difference in how stocks are performing, depending on whether or not you're a tech stock, right? So for the S&P 500, the blue line here, that's what's going on with the top 10 S&P stocks, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, Alphabet is Google, right? Berkshire Hathaway, um, Visa, right? More people are buying online, so more people are using a credit card, right? Those uh, companies, their stock price is really elevated. Um, for everybody else, the remaining 490 stocks, um, the S&P is still below where it was uh, in January, February. And so the wide, wide discrepancy between stocks that are doing well because of the pandemic and all of the others. Right. Okay, so that's, that's the top of the K, the bottom of the K. Um, here, this is like the consumer spending graph that I had up at the beginning, um, but it's for employment by different uh, wage groups. Right, so the red is high wage, and they have seen an increase in employment. Uh, middle wage has seen about a 4.4% decline, percent decline in employment. Um, and low wage jobs are down about a fifth, 21%, right, with very little uh, prospect for regaining that. Right? So the great inequality here um, in terms of who is losing their jobs. Right? Uh, low income troubles. It turns out that uh, between October 28 and early November, one in three adults had trouble paying for usual household expenses in the last week. Uh, for all adults, that was one in, one in three. For black, and, black families, that was about half. Latino, 47%. Other multiracial, 41%. Um, and there is the rest, right? And so enormous hardship uh, is being experienced. 
um, a lot of food insecurity. Um, I don't want to go through this for time, but think about this purple. This is very low food security among children, right? The purple line. And that's where it was before the pandemic and now where right, it's jumped up from about 5% food insecurity for kids to, to nearly 20% of food insecurity for kids, right? So that's a problem. Huge structural changes uh, in the economy. Um, but I wanna point out that the pandemic has really been more of an accelerant um, and not a change agent, right? That is to say that it has pushed trends that were pre-existing in the economy. It has pushed them forward so in some cases by years. Right, so let's think about retail. Right? Everybody started buying from Amazon. A lot of people who hadn't previously are now getting pretty comfortable with it. Right, so uh, we're going to be buying more online and brick and mortar. Uh, retail establishments have probably taken a hit from which they'll never recover. Telecommuting, boom, had a grand experiment in telecommuting. Um, I think we're in a telecommuting honeymoon where a couple of years from now we will not be telecommuting. Uh, companies like Twitter who have said employees never need to come back into the office, I think that will probably change over time. But telecommuting will, will definitely be higher in the wake of the pandemic that is now. Um, telehealth, boy, I don't know about you all, but if I could do all of my healthcare by <laughs> internet, that would be great. You don't have to sit in a waiting room. Uh, so that's a productivity improver. Business travel is way, way down. Um, probably won't recover for a very long time. As we talked about uh, the K-shaped recovery, wealth concentration is growing. Um, the statistic that I heard recently is that 15, the top 15 wealthiest families, that's one five, uh, have as much wealth as the bottom 50% uh, in the United States economy. Lots of industry concentration uh, as small companies are going out of business and large companies are picking up uh, their business. Automation uh, is accelerating. Um, and even NFL scoring um, is increasing. We've got a graph on that, right? So scoring average points per team per game was on an upward trajectory, right? But this is 2017, 18, 19, and boom, we're up at 2020, right? So part of that big jump was just long-term trends. Part of it uh, is that quarterbacks and offenses perform better when there's no crowd. There's no crowd noise and they perform better in away venues because they're not fighting the crowd either. All right. So this is, this is, you know, partly just fun because we're in the little playoff season. Um, and partly, you know, there are implications of the pandemic um, that we just don't think about. I never would have thought that it would dramatically affect average points per team per game to the extent that it has. So the, the, the implications uh, of COVID really run throughout the economy. All right, so there's good news, sort of. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was no short, there were no short run macro problems. There were no structural obstacles to the economy performing. We weren't looking, economists were looking really, really hard um, for what's gonna bring on the next recession because we were 10 years from the last one, so we were due. Nobody really knew because um, things looked pretty good. Um, our main concern going forward is that temporary disruptions will turn into permanent ones. And um, that change will be hard to adapt to over the long term, right? Things are not as bad as they could be, right? Federal Reserve and Congress, right? And Federal Reserve was literally heroic throughout all of this. They did everything they could and then lots of things that people didn't think they could. Um, Congress and the White House, uh, we had an enormous amount of spending early on um, and that was really important to prevent a complete collapse of labor and productive markets. Um, that's, that's, that's not to deny the fiscal policy gap that I talked about and the fact that I think that um, the, the recent spending plan is not big enough. Uh, I, I, I think it is not big enough. Um, savings uh, are off the charts. Um, why is that good news? Um, that's good news uh, for the recovery. People have a lot of money that when we're in recovery, uh, they'll be able to spend. Right? So the red line here is the savings rate, savings as a percent of disposable or after tax income. Right, it went, it went way up to about 33%. Um, we haven't seen 33% savings rate since I believe the 50s, right? Um, and now it's down at about 12.9%, right? So the percent of disposable income has gone way up. And the green line here is disposable income. It also went way up. It went way up because of the government spending, right? So there's lots of saving that can be pent up demand for when we get into a recovery. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, causes for concern, economic inequality is a big problem. State and local governments are a huge problem going forward. Um, eviction and foreclosures are going to be an enormous burden um, once the foreclosure ban uh, is lifted. 
let me conclude and then I'll take questions, right? COVID-19, it's a health crisis that has enormous macroeconomic implications, particularly with regard to equity issues, significant structural changes. Again, it's an accelerant for trends that were already in place. GDP is gonna contract between three and 5% this year, but positive growth will be back next year. Um, government induced uh, spending uh, caused the growth in Q3 and that stopped in Q4. So Q4 is gonna be pretty bad when it's released in a couple of weeks. Policy gap has created enormous hardship um, and the economy is not going to recover uh, until we get uh, the health aspects of the pandemic under control. Hopefully the vaccine will do that, but I for one have been enormously disappointed um, at how poorly the vaccine has been rolled out. Hopefully uh, that will change uh, in the coming months and we'll get back on track. Okay, I apologize, there's a little bit of a fire hose, but there's a lot of talk, a lot to talk about. Um, that's what I have. Um, here's some contact information for need, but I will send that to Ron as well and hopefully he'll circulate that to the rest of you. Um, so I will stop sharing. Uh, I'll hope that you all are still there uh, and I'll take questions for as long as you like. I, I, John, we have a number of questions and uh, thank you for anticipating some of them and answering them already. Um, I'll start with a comment from one of our members about no wonder why they call economics the dismal science. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, from time to time, it's truly dismal. You know, I, I really start, I really first started giving presentations um, on the U.S. economy in about 2007. <laughs> okay. Um, first round of questions is on monetary policy. So has the Federal Reserve pretty much done what they can do or, or do they have anything left in the gun? You know? Um, you know, they, they, they don't have much left that they can do. They can continue to, to shore up the economy and to back up loans and keep some fluidity in lending markets. Um, the Treasury has hamstrung them a little bit uh, because they've taken away some of their, their, their loan support um, capacity. Um, hopefully that will come back with, with a new administration. Um, but they've they've done you know they they, they uh, carried out every every play in Ben Bernanke's playbook from the from the global financial crisis and implement a few new ones. Um, so they've they're they're pretty much tapped out, you know, with regard to um, specific policies. But they they are providing ongoing support. Yeah. And and on deficits, so the federal government is borrowing quite a bit of money and even more in the future. Uh, individuals, uh, you know, if they have a small business or they're on the bottom end of that K, uh, they'll be borrowing money. So yep. at what point does that trigger inflation? Oh, um, you know, in, in inflation is sort of the least of my worries these days. Um, you know, I, I got that question incessantly during the global financial crisis because uh, the Federal Reserve, as it is now, was expanding the money supply so significantly. Um, I, I don't worry about it very much. Um, you know, it's 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 far in the distance. Um, no way it's going to start to rear its ugly head um, until we get the economy back to full employment um, and we're chugging along. And that's 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 a ways off. Are you worried about the banks or the financial sector? A um, little bit. Reserves and things like that. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm mostly worried about smaller banks. Um, because uh, you know those with with commercial loans, um, you know whether whether that's residential um, uh, rental loans or commercial, um, there's going to be a lot of turmoil in those markets going forward. You know the big banks, I, I don't ever worry about them, um, but smaller banks and some credit unions, you know, could be in a tight spot ultimately. Um, I, I know that a bunch of them are hurting now, but I, I think that there will be support over the long term. So I don't I don't lose sleep over them. You mentioned the stock market as being kind of the best game in town for yeah. investors. Would you put real estate in that category? Uh, residential, non-rental real estate? Uh, sure. You know, that, that really depends on where you are. Um, uh, I, there are I, I sort of mentioned that there are a bunch of bonus slides at the end of this that I didn't have time for. If you download my slides off of uh, the NEED website, you'll get those. Um, and in there are some some slides about real estate around the Bay Area, right? Don't buy real estate in San Francisco. Well, or maybe do because it's down. Um, but in Marin uh, and in the East Bay, uh, I know that uh, the residential property rates have been going up. 
Um, in the Bay Area, residential pro property is always a good idea. Um, but it's but it's it's really bifurcated into places people are leaving versus pla places people are going. Um, and it's more sort of suburban areas, Marin and the East Bay, uh, where you all are, where people are going. So those are pretty good real estate markets these days. So where will the pent up demand go? Is that just consumer driven, uh, you know, everyday things people need or, or will it go into other places? Um, well, it, I, I, it's a really good question. Um, you know, people are already buying a lot of stuff. Um, expenditures on goods um, are way up. Um, so it will go to, you know, we, we might see people eating out every day <laughs> once, once they're able to. Um, just, just not, not clear. Um, you know, it, it may well stay in their savings accounts uh, as, a, as a stock of, of investment funds for, for the future, which would be a good thing. Yeah. There's a proposal to raise uh, federal taxes for those making more than 400 a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems like a modest amount to start. We may need more in federal taxes or even state and local taxes. Yep. What's, what's your prognostication for taxes? Oh, we, we, we have to have tax increases, right? Um, you know, we have, we have cut so many programs to the bone um, that we're kind of left with two options. Um, one option is to raise taxes. Uh, another option is to find some way of getting health care costs under control because um, it's the aging of the population and health care costs that are really driving um, the difficulties in the bu in de budget deficits going forward. Um, so it's going to be going to have to be some sort of some combination of the two of those and raising taxes on those making four hundred thousand um, dollars. Part of that is is um, uh, uh, payroll taxes. Right. Social security taxes are now capped. At, I don't know what it is, but one hundred about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So if you make a million dollars a year, you don't pay payroll taxes on you know, almost nine tenths of that. Right? And that, that doesn't make any sense. So maybe leave a hole for those making between 130 and 400, but raising pay, payroll taxes on those making above $400,000, I think that's got, got exactly zero implication for the economy and very little implication for those folks as well. Yeah. And then last question, um, for those individuals who may have lost their job or uh, they're Falling uh, to automation, you know, automation replacing their jobs or yeah. whatever, they're not able to work from home as, as some people are in the Bay Area. Um, what do we do with that kind of permanent underclass that may be created for those people who have lost their job and can't compete? Well, for a wide variety of reasons, and I, I should have mentioned it in the talk, but I, I think that we should take hundreds of billions of dollars and start up retraining programs. Right, we're gonna we're gonna need that going forward, regardless of the pandemic. Um, and I would have pre-pandemic said there's no great rush, um, but now I think that we should be devoting enormous resources to figuring out how best to do that, and then start doing it. Right? I've got a great talk on autonomous vehicles, um, and that's going to lead to the loss of about 10 million jobs. That's going to be a lot of people that we're going to need to retrain. So let's get started now, because the, the problem is more urgent than it otherwise would have been. All right, John, thank you so much. Appreciate your attention to our questions. Yes. You bet. Thank right. you so much, John. We oh, really my, my pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, again, uh, if you'd like uh, myself or another need delegate to come in and speak on another topic, be delighted to set that up. Um, parting shot, I, I am the executive director of a nonprofit, so if you enjoyed this, um, there is no such thing as a donation too big or too small. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, be Thank well, you. everybody. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much.